This is my Belgian Pinfire Revolver. In previous videos, I discussed its history and conserved it for the future. I also made the missing loading gate. With the revolver fully functional, In this video, I'm going to discuss making the cartridges, and then, of course, I'll proceed to shoot them. A pinfire cartridge looks like this. There's a case with a closed back, and near the back is a pin sticking out the side. The pin is resting against the percussion cap that's inside the case, which serves as the primer. The pin is essentially a firing pin, the cases are loaded into the revolver so that the pins fit through the slots in the cylinder, which also serves to set the headspace. When in position, the pin is pointing up and is hit by the flat face of the hammer. This revolver is chambered in 9mm pin fire. Due to the era that this gun was made in, the mid to late 19th century, I'm not taking that designation for granted. I found a spec sheet for the cartridge, but due to manufacturing tolerances that could vary greatly, not only due to the era, but also due to the small workshops that made these guns, I'm going to be taking all of my measurements directly off of the revolver in order to make the cartridges, and that's what I recommend you do if you're following along to make your own. I'm starting with the bore, I'll use these, small hole gauges, to measure the grooves. You can also use a casting alloy, such as Safe, where you could drive a lead ball through and then measure that. But I found that with practice, I can get very accurate results with these gauges. There's the result, 0.356, so I'll want a lead bullet a few thousandths larger. The cylinder I can measure in the same way. The result is 0.390, but it's not that sized all the way through. The chambers in this cylinder are tapered. They measure 0.386 about halfway down, and at the front. They measure 0.376, which is a slight taper from the 0.390 at the rear. I measured all of the chambers, and they're all within one to two thousands, which is very impressive for the time that this was made. The cases will be made from standard brass cases. I can measure their diameter, or fit them in the cylinder as a test. A 223 case fits in loosely, sliding almost all the way through, but stops close to the front, which demonstrates the taper within the chamber. These two cases are a perfect fit, just the right size to slide in easily, and once fully seated, they're a snug fit. It makes sense that they fit the same, since they're both based on the same parent cartridge. My first loads were based on this, 762 by 25 Tokarev. I straightened out the neck to fit a 9mm bullet, but then I ran into an issue where the chamber's taper stopped it from seating all the way. I also realized I didn't need the extra length due to the light powder charge. 
So what I'm making brass from is this 9 by 19 millimeter Luger. Here it is compared to the finished product. I didn't trim the front, so aligning them. This is how much was trimmed off the back. And that's the first step in making the cases. I'll put the casing in the three draw chuck on the lathe. I'm just eyeballing how far to trim. Just past where the extractor groove starts. So when it's trimmed, there's a slight chamfer left over. This could also be done by hand with a hacksaw and files. To plug the flash holes, I'll use a regular plumbing solder and flux. I'll try to push the flux down into the hole. Then I can place the casing on a steel rod in order to solder using a propane torch. I'll do it again. I'm trying to heat the casing up only enough to get the solder to flow and attach. It only takes around five, six, or seven seconds per case. Once the solder has cooled, I can file away any excess flush to the brass. or do the same in the lathe. Once trimmed, there may be some cases that have larger air pockets on the solder, or worse, unplugged flash holes. These I'll redo. When cases do look good, this is very hard to show on video, but sometimes the solder flows down into the flash hole and there's excess on the inside. This will prevent the percussion cap from seating all the way. I'll gently hold the casing in the vise without crushing it. Then I'll use a drill bit smaller than the inside just to touch and remove the excess solder. It's hard to see, but the circle is what the drill bit removed. There's no excess solder, and it just touched the brass of the casing. The next step is to drill for the pin. For that, I'll put a case in the revolver. Close the gate, and use the ejector rod to hold the case back up against the gate. Then I can put a center punch in the slot. That marks the location for the pin, which also sets the headspace. Over on the drill press, I have a center drill and a vise with a small piece of scrap in the jaws. This does two things. The space between the jaws provides a seat for the casing on its side, and the scrap provides an end stop for locating. Now, to align everything so that the center drill is directly on the punch mark on the casing. And once everything is set, I can just touch the case
then mark all of the cases. I'll swap to a number 47 or a 2mm drill bit. I'll align the center drill marks and then drill through. For the pins, I have these brass rods. They're two millimeters in diameter. I'm using wire cutters to cut them up into lengths a bit longer than needed. To round off one end, I'll chuck it in a drill and run it along this file. This will be the end that's on the inside of the case, the one that strikes the primer. Trimming the pins one by one is time consuming. To trim the other end to length, I'll do them in batches. With this wood block, I'll align the same drill bit as before to a mark for holes to hold the pins. I'll drill five holes at intervals, all to the same depth. I'll mark the approximate length of the pins. Then I'll put it in one of the holes. Make sure it's seated all the way. And then cut it off. I'll file it down. And as I file, I'll check the length. This needs to come down about 40 thousandths more. When it's that much, I can cut off most of the excess and then clean it up with the file. This length is just what I'm looking for. Then I can use this as a pattern for the others, putting it back into the block and measuring how much is sticking out. So I'll be looking for around this number as I trim the rest of the pins. Now to add the pins to the cases, with the rounded end first. Usually they're a tight fit, so pliers are needed to squeeze them in. I'm 
At this point, I'll double check that the cases fit in the revolver. With them pushed all the way in so that the pin is at the front of the slot, the rear of the casing should be flush with the back of the cylinder. I can make sure of this by rotating the cylinder. If they were sticking out the back, the cylinder wouldn't be able to turn. At this point, the cases are complete and ready to start loading. For primers, I have percussion caps. Number 10 or 11 works. I haven't found a difference. They need to be oriented so that the pin is inside the cup. Shaking the cases might work, but usually you need to use something to move them around. I'll get the cap under the pin, push the pin in, then I can orient it again so that the pin will strike the center of the cap. Then carefully push the pin so that it's against the priming compound. If they're not aligned properly, there's a chance they won't go off. Once the pin is seated, there's one more thing to test, and that is that the pin doesn't stick out too far to the point where I can't rotate the cylinder. The pin has to fit through this notch in the frame. Now that I know that the pins aren't too long, I can continue priming the rest. To ensure the percussion cap doesn't move around while loading, I have this clear nail polish. I'll brush on a drop at the bottom of the cap where it's seated against the side of the case. Some of the cases have pins fitting a bit looser than others. For them, I'll put a drop on the pins as well. That's just these first two. The others I needed to use pliers to seat the pins, so I don't need anything else to hold the pins in place. I will add a drop to the caps though. For the rest of the loading, I'll be using an arbor press. You could use pliers, or very carefully, a hammer, or a reloading press with some sort of solid insert. One piece of reloading gear I will be using is this Lee expander. Actually, just this one expanding die. With a light touch, I'm adding a very small bell to the end of the casing just enough to open it up to accept the bullet. For the charge, I have black powder, 3F size. This powder measure is set to 8 grains. I'll scoop it in. Cut it flush. Then fill the case.
I need a wad before the bullet. I usually use food boxes, something with a slick or a wax coating. This punch is 3 8 a bit oversized than the case. Once the wads are cut, they're slightly cupped, so I'll use that as an advantage to be able to push them into the cases. Sometimes the wads don't go in right, and they don't cover the powder. I'll redo these, but for the rest, I'll gently seat the wad on the powder. For bullets, I have these already cast bullets. They're 38 caliber, 0.359 diameter. They came pre-lubed, but the lube is hard and for smokeless powder. I replaced it with a soft lube, better suited for black powder, made from equal parts Crisco and beeswax. It's important that the wads and the bullets take up all the remaining air space in the casing. So with one wad, these bullets will be seated right up to the taper. For seating, I'll again use the arbor press. The flat nose of the bullet won't be deformed by the ram. There's one last thing to do, and that is to lightly crimp the case mouth. For that, I have a 223 sizing die. Anything that's just slightly smaller than the case diameter should work. I'll align it and give it a very small press. It's less of a crimp and more like I'm just removing the bell on the end of the case left over by the expander. I'll check one final time in the revolver to make sure that the rear of the case is flush to the back of the cylinder. I won't rotate it into position since these are now live cases. I made a few more than I showed. Time to head to the range. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's all for this video. Thanks for watching.